was April of 1978. We preempted our regular programming to broadcast the funeral of four Syracuse firefighters as a community honored their fallen heroes. They came to honor four members of the Syracuse Fire Department who fearful that someone else might die, died themselves. It's estimated by Stanley the Duda, Michael Petrignani, Frank Cordelia, Robert Schuler. They were honored in a joint funeral service at the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. I remember expressing my sympathies to Fire Chief Tom Hanley, and all he could do was pat me on the shoulder and he walked away with his head bowed. But you could, you could see in his eyes that this was a man who in a very real sense felt as if he had lost four sons. And I guess the whole community felt the same way. Some very sad news. Deputy David Clark of our jail division uh, expired at about one o'clock this morning. Billy Blake had gunned down Clark and wounded his partner, Bernie Molesky, during an escape attempt in 1987. And I suppose the thing I remember most is that evil smirk on Blake's face when he was taken into custody, proud that he had killed a cop. Once again, the bells tolled for a fallen hero. A widow wept, and we were all reminded of the dangers faced by the men and women in uniform. I remember how those words sent a chill through the newsroom that October day in 1990. Very confusing scene at this point right now, Ron, as you can tell. Uh, there are... I have just received uh, official confirmation by way of Keith Koblen, one of our other reporters here who has spoken to the police. The police officer in question has died. Uh, scenes such as this are sad for everyone involved and, of course, for the, the men and women of the police department and the members of Investigator Howard's family. It is incredible pain. I suppose the thing I remember most from the Howard funeral was police chief Lee Hunt as he talked to Howard's young son. I think that it's important for Wally III to know that I see him crying there that grown men cry too. It's been eight years since Wally Howard Jr. was laid to rest this year, for the first time, the slain officer's father, Wally Howard Sr., talked about the tragedy in this exclusive interview. The undercover police officer was shot and badly wounded. The suspect's almost immediately grabbed by police. And then a long, tense time, while police here at the scene worked, they waited for word from the hospital. Wally Howard Sr. was in the neighborhood that day in October 1990 when his son was shot. I saw the crowd and I walked down there and the police notified me. Well, the officer that uh, took me to the hospital said it was serious. Wally Howard Jr. died from his injuries, and men and women in blue from across the Northeast joined the city in a very public grieving. Now, most of the people here never knew Wally Howard. But he was a cop, and that means he was family. Yes, it, that was a comfort, too. Knowing that he was trying to do and was doing the right thing. In my conversation with Wally Sr., the father of the slain police officer said it was a comfort to him that his son died a hero, doing the right thing. But the pain still remains. As years uh, pass, the the wound seemed to open a little bit wider and wider. Another major story involved the downfall of Lee Alexander. The four-term mayor is credited with many important achievements, but he went to prison shortly after leaving office after being convicted of a kickback and extortion scheme that began shortly after he took office in 1970. I, Lee Alexander, do solemnly swear he was attractive, articulate, charismatic, and talented. He had it all. 
His 16 years as mayor began in 1970. He helped rebuild the city's infrastructure, led the Democratic Conference of Mayors, and was a very strong voice for the nation's cities. And he had many other achievements as well. But his accomplishments were overshadowed by scandal, scandal that surfaced shortly after he left City Hall. It's been years since feds heard their first rumors about Alexander. Since then, there have been thousands of pages of documents, testimony, video and audio tapes, and polygraph tests. In the beginning, prosecutors agree that no one realized the scope of the scheme of corruption they were about to unravel. After months of denial and delaying tactics and vows to clear his name, Alexander finally pleaded guilty. Scott Atkinson is among the several reporters that we have on duty at the federal building. And Scott, what's transpired since last you spoke with us? Something that I never thought I'd see, Ron. Lee Alexander walked out of the federal courthouse less than five minutes ago, and he apologized. What I did was my personal responsibility, my personal fault, my mistakes were my own, and no one else's. We put together a documentary that aired the evening Alexander was sentenced to 10 years in prison. We talked to some of the men who were part of the conspiracy, men like Demo Staffis, who collected the kickbacks for Alexander. I really don't know. I've regretted it for many, many years. Not since the investigation, but it goes way back. And I've um, wanted to get out and I did get out. Alexander kept pretty much to himself when he got out of prison, but he did sit down with me for an exclusive interview. Oh, the people of Syracuse have been wonderful. Wherever I go, they come up to me and tell me that they're glad to see me home. And they've, they've been very swell. He granted the interview to talk about one thing, the death of President Nixon, a man that Alexander felt did much to help cities like Syracuse. But I couldn't help but feel the, the irony of that moment. Nixon's fall from the highest office in the land because of his desire to consolidate his power. And Alexander tarnished the city's highest office because of greed. When Lee Alexander died on Christmas Day in 1996, he had made his peace with the city that he loved. And some of his most bitter rivals, including Roy Bernardi, eulogized Alexander at a public memorial service. I say farewell to my fellow captain, my friend. May you rest in peace, and may you be judged kindly. Two years after Alexander's death, I talked with one of the men who went to prison in the extortion kickback scheme, businessman Zeke Spaulding. What I did was my personal responsibility, my personal fault, my mistakes were my own, and no one else's. But Lee Alexander's kickback scheme involved others, contractors like architects and insurance agents. They were sent to prison for taking part in the conspiracy. Zeke Spaulding was a close friend of Alexander, and was part owner of the Hotel Syracuse. He went to prison for paying off Alexander to win approval of a hotel expansion. Well, you get swept up at a time. I guess I was best described by somebody charitably as if I didn't have bad judgment in those years, I wouldn't have had any. Spaulding, like Alexander, had lost his career and his freedom. But he still had the support of close friends and family. In our recent conversation, he told me he was determined to turn his life around. That period of time in my life saved my life. I'd, I wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for that time. I was going to come back from prison having won for that period of time I was there and not gotten beat by it. Spaulding also had an alcohol problem. So he did what he knows best to help others with similar problems. He made a business deal that led to construction of the Tully Hill Alcohol and Drug Rehabilitation Center. On balance, I wouldn't change one day of those years, not one day, and have no resentments and have no problem in looking back as a great change in my life. So no, I have no complaints about that. The same year the Alexander scandal came to a head, 1988, perhaps the biggest and most tragic story to hit central New York exploded into our consciousness in December. 
the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. No one seems to know exactly what happened, but certainly at least four houses have disappeared. With the horror, and investigators began searching through the devastation in Lockerbie, Scotland. Syracuse University is a campus in mourning tonight. There were so many emotions that night, shock, disbelief, sadness, even in our newsroom. Now, we had reported air crashes before, but never one where so many of the victims, 37, had ties to our hometown. Life went on on campus, but it was really tough. Many students have already left campus for the holidays. There was a memorial service at Hendricks Chapel. At the Dome this morning, football players preparing for the Hall of Fame Bowl had a job to do as well. Well, I think that uh, all of us really don't have uh, all of the information, but I know that none of us really got a lot of sleep last night. Yeah, it's, it's tough, but, um, you know, life goes on and you have to continue. It's hard thinking about what happened especially at this time. Certainly no time is a, is a good time for a tragedy like this, but this was an especially bad time of year with the holiday season. At City Hall, the mood was much as it was at SU. Flags here and at the nearby State Tower building were kept at half staff. There's always a lot of joking, sometimes even gallows humor in the newsroom, but not that day. I remember it being so somber, and it was like that everywhere, and people tried to cope in their own way. Bill Baker with you at 1017. Dave White with news and information coming up at 1030, a two-minute news update concerning the flight 103 Pan Am and the loss. WSYR's Bill Baker turned over part of his morning show to the listeners, taking their calls. Some callers openly wept on the air. It was suggested that everyone wear just a, an orange ribbon to show solidarity with the people who had the loss. And uh, I'm encouraging that. I was standing in front of Hendricks Chapel, anchoring the news that evening, and we, we put on the screen the pictures of the victims when it really hit me. So many, so young, all with so much promise. Paula Alderman was a Cornell student studying in England when several years ago she met Glenn Bowkley in London. The two corresponded by mail and were married a short time later. Paula was a part of the extended TB5 family. When she and her sisters were children, their angelic voices were a big part of our holiday special. One of Paula's sisters is Martha Alderman Boyer. I recently talked with her about that dark December day 10 years ago. I didn't know for sure, but I had a feeling. Horror and bewilderment. No one seems to know exactly what happened. But it was December 21st, 1988. Pan Am 103 is blown out of the sky by a terrorist bomb. And Martha Boyer's feeling was painfully accurate. And I'd just gotten in the door and turned on the news, which I normally, just turned on the television, which I normally don't do in, during the daytime. And it was on, it happened just about an hour earlier, but I had just the kind of feeling that's, that was it. Martha told me she and her husband were living in Amherst at the time, and we're expecting Paula and Glenn to join them and the rest of the family in western New York for Christmas. Martha and her sisters had shared many Christmases with central New York. The four girls appeared in annual WTVH Christmas specials in the 1960s, called Time of Wonder, Time of Joy. But there was no joy on that December night in 1988. Over the years, Martha says, 
The pain has diminished, but there are always reminders. It gets um, hard is on the anniversary because my husband and I always go up to the, uh, to the uh, memorial and uh, listen to the bells. Um, there's a song played first, and I can't recall what it is, but then they do the bells. And that's the hardest thing is listening to 35 bells. The families of many of the victims of Pan Am 103 are frustrated and angry at the United States because they feel they haven't done enough to bring the two Libyans suspected of the bombing to justice. Martha Alderman shares that opinion, but she hasn't been active in any of the groups. She's concentrating most of her energy these days on her children and getting on with life. Another story that many will long remember is the blizzard of 66 a storm that paralyzed much of central New York. It was all you could see, snow everywhere. Now the warning for heavy snow went out on Saturday, January 29th, but nobody, nobody was prepared for the more than three and a half feet that fell over a 37 hour period. And it was piled even deeper in Oswego. Well, as you can see, they've had quite a bit of snow here in Oswego. As we said, about 102 inches. Eight and a half feet. Think about that. Eight and a half feet of snow. Well, they used helicopters to get badly needed supplies like food and coal to some isolated areas. And the weight of the snow also proved to be too much for some buildings. Inside, this is what it looks like at the west end of Sears Store in Fairmont Fair. I also remember that many of us were snowed in here. We were put up at a nearby motel, but they started running out of food in a few days. And the final day that we were there, when we went to the dining room for breakfast, we were told they'd run out of eggs, bacon, ham, bread, milk. So we asked if they had anything at all. And they said, yes, they had prime rib. So that was our breakfast that day. Well, that's at least one way to get around on a day like this. A lot of the roads are still blocked. We're on Benedict Road, not far from East Syracuse. And as you can see by the sign over here that these boys have taken some time to put up, you can't get very far down the road. Schools were, were closed for about a week, and it was four or five days before most streets in the city were passable. And up north, bulldozers were used to clear the way for police and ambulance crews. It's been extremely rough. Of course, we're beginning to see a little daylight here, and uh, we hope by mid-afternoon with the equipment, which we have finally managed to get from the state, uh, that once we get the plows going, we'll be able to have a little bit of traffic control, which is, of course, really One of the local leaders charged with handling the emergency was then Onondaga County Executive John Mulroy, who reminisced about the storm and its aftermath. The intensity and uh, very widespread uh, coverage of that particular storm caught everybody by surprise, and it was it turned out to be a disaster. John Mulroy was Onondaga yeah, yeah. County's this first Fred. county executive, Fred, Fred, and Fred, he was Fred. at the helm when the blizzard of 66 hit. Twenty-seven years later, Mulroy watched from the sidelines as county and city officials coped with the storm with far more resources at their disposal than he and Syracuse Mayor Bill Walsh had available. People didn't have uh, snowmobiles in those days and they didn't have four-wheel drive vehicles. And uh, it was a much slower process getting out. Remember, there were city streets even that weren't open for a week. And Salina Street had 20 feet of snow in it. The only way to open it was to pick it up and carry it away, which we did. Mulroy still remembers how many county and city employees somehow managed to get to their jobs, and how others stayed at their posts for days when their relief couldn't get in. Another example of community spirit at its finest. Central New York is also filled with dedicated basketball fans. fans who have been rewarded over the years with three appearances in the final four by the Syracuse Orangemen. Among them, that dramatic trip to New Orleans in 1987.
1987 was really, really special because no one had expected the Orange to beat North Carolina to win a berth in the Final Four. And, and when the team returned from the Meadowlands, the town just went wild. I'll never forget the crowd at Hancock Airport that greeted the team. That was close to midnight. This means so much to all of us having all of you come out here today. And, you know, we had a great feeling this afternoon, but I think the feeling here tonight is even better. Syracuse was decked out in orange, and even non-basketball fans were caught up in the frenzy. And several thousand fans made the trip to the big games, and for those who didn't, well, TV5 was their eyewitness. In New York City, it's Fifth Avenue, Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., the Champs-Élysées in Paris, or the Via Veneto in Rome. But in New Orleans, it's Bourbon Street. It was the perfect place for the final four. Everybody, everybody was in a festive mood, especially after we beat Providence. But as often happens, the celebration got out of hand, and those of us working in New Orleans at the time, we saw the pictures of the disturbance from Marshall Street that made national news. Violence that broke out after both the Providence and Indiana games. It was sad, really, because it, it took away from all the hard work of the team and showed our town in a bad light. But then, quite appropriately, the attention did shift back to basketball, and an incredible game. The final face-off between SU and Indiana. For Indiana and Douglas Prieste. But Indiana went with what they have most of the year, Steve Alfred and the three-pointer. SU countered with their favorite play, Sherman Douglas alley oop to Ronnie Shankly. Now near the end of the game, I, I went outside to prepare for a live satellite report back to Syracuse about what looked to be an orange victory. So at that point, I couldn't see the game. I could just hear it in my earpiece. When suddenly I, I heard a roar from the Superdome and Brent Musburger. Smart takes the shot, oh, and the Hoosiers with three seconds. And the producer yelled, what happened, what happened? I said, they lost. I was stunned just like everyone else. They had played their hearts out and come so close, but it was not to be. In a recent conversation, SU basketball coach Jim Beheim reflects on the highs and lows of that incredible journey to New Orleans in 1987. Syracuse went wild when the Orangemen beat North Carolina and won a berth in the Final Four. That is a huge factor for me uh, being here for really all my adult life in, in Syracuse and seeing the support we get. The fans were rewarded with a victory over Providence and then came a game neither the fans nor Beheim will ever forget. We really had pretty good control of the game. It wasn't a game that was even. We really had control the last uh, seven or eight minutes and uh, we just couldn't quite put it away. Indiana made a couple great plays and we didn't really uh, do anything bad at the end. Uh, Indiana made a couple real good shots and won a very close game. But in the final seconds, Indiana's Keith Smart made his famous jump shot. Smart takes the shot, oh! and the Hoosiers with three seconds. Go ahead. Nobody stopped. We really weren't effective. But when you lose like that and, and you have such a great opportunity to win, uh, it's very difficult to get over. I think that game lives with you forever, certainly for at least five to t six, seven years. It's, it was almost an everyday thought <laughs> in your mind. And after, after 10 years or so, uh, it's not an everyday thought, but it, it occurs from time to time. Bayheim and the Orange went to the Final Four again in 1996. This time, they lost the championship game to Kentucky, but in much less dramatic fashion. 
The start of each season brings new promise, thoughts that maybe this time the Orange can win that one elusive game, the big one that got away. In one year, they will. Well, those were some of the stories I found to be the most memorable from my 32 years in news here at Channel 5. Of course, our station went on the air in December of 1948. And in those 50 years, we've seen a lot of changes. Baby face, my baby face. You've got the cutest little baby face. 1948. Babies were booming, and so was the post-war economy. General Electric opened its electronics park, where thousands of people built TV sets for the boomers and their parents. We went on the air in December of 48, filling all those TV sets with entertainment, as well as lots of local news, weather, and those human interest stories that are timeless. Mr. Announcer Man, Mr. Announcer Man, I'm Merrily and I know the magic key. Before Sesame Street and Barney, thousands of Central New York children grew up with the magic toy shop. Merrily, Eddie Flumdum, Mr. Trolley, Twinkle, and the Play Lady entertained and educated children with an astounding 6,200 shows over 27 years. Do you know that with the original tro uh, <laughs> trolley head, it was plugged into the wall, and every time I wanted and to I light my nose, I'd have to... I made it out of button. metal. <laughs> <laughs> and I, every time I lit my nose, I'd get a shock. Uh. <laughs> and that went on for a long time. We were very lucky, Ron, that we had the talented cast members right here in the station. Just mm -hmm. think about that combination. Every time I watch a scene from Magic Tour Shop, I marvel again at our good fortune that we didn't need to look beyond this station. A little breakfast here this morning. Before he became America's most popular weatherman, the Today Show's Al Roker was Big Al, and he was a busy guy here at Channel 5. I mean, the great thing about Channel 5 was that, you know, there wasn't this strict, rigid division. You do this, you do that, you do that. Everybody did a little bit of everything. Uh, back then, uh, I would cut my own pieces. Uh, I would do some graphics because I have a little bit of an art background. I did whatever I needed to do to, to help out, and so did everybody else. Everybody pitched in. All right. After having the six-game win streak snapped last night... Another alum, another ABC Sports' Mike Tirico, started here while still in college. <laughs> Campaign 76. It's time in 1976, we elected a new president and entered a new era in bringing you the news. The Live Eye was born, the first in upstate New York. And despite uh, the heavy uh, Republican returns locally in the local races, the spirit here is quite good, quite high, very uh, noisy, very raucous. Now, Ron Curtis. Soon after, Satellites helped us deliver to you stories with ties to central New York from around the world. Did you know, though, that when you were here and throwing stones at the Capitol... We traveled to Belfast for Project Children and to the deserts of Saudi Arabia, where the boys from Syracuse served our country. Hello again. Remember the presidential nominating conventions and the fun of trips to the Final Four. Go to check in with meteorologist Kathy Orr and David Muir, who are with some We of also friends. pioneered the idea of taking the news on the road, giving viewers a chance to see how we work, a chance to meet the people in front of and behind the camera. The technology has changed over 50 years and continues to evolve. But one thing will never change, our commitment to you. This program is in tribute to our colleague and friend, Ron Curtis.